Economic historians contend that the two institutions that had the greatest impact on the 20th century were capitalism and slavery. The basic argument goes something like this. The high profits from slavery helped finance the Industrial Revolution, providing multi-generational foundation of wealth that sustained many nations and families throughout the entire 20th century. And while there are some disagreements about the impacts of slavery over the 20th century, there's one thing that almost all these historians get wrong. They talk about slavery only in the past tense. Slavery is not gone. In fact, there are 40 million slaves in the world today. That's almost three times more than the entire 400 year history of transatlantic slavery. Slavery is not ended, it's just shifted. Now when you look at this map, the basic summary is that the more red there is, the more slaves there are. So this tells us two things. First, slavery is everywhere. But second, is that it's a particularly big problem in Asia right now. In total, there's about 25 million people that are estimated to be victims of modern slavery in Asia. That includes an estimated 73% of all victims of sexual exploitation and 66% of all victims of forced labor. Now, if you're asking how that's possible today, given so much awareness and concern for human rights, the answers are really complicated but also simple. But what I want to point out is that for the most part, people just don't understand it and therefore they don't see it in their daily lives. In fact, within three months of my family moving to Hong Kong, I, like millions of other people across Asia, had unwittingly and unknowingly facilitated human trafficking. You see, when we moved to Hong Kong, uh, we learned it was really common to hire what is known as a foreign domestic worker. Now, if you're not familiar with that concept, it's common throughout Asia and the Middle East for people to hire migrant uh, workers, particularly women, to help provide full-time care and service in their home. Now, at the time, my wife and I were young parents with two small children, and I was working long hours at an international law firm. So when we heard that you could hire someone to provide full-time service in your home, it sounded too good to be true. And we, fired, we found a young woman from Indonesia that we wanted to hire, and we had to process her paperwork through an employment agency. And my wife told me that there's two agencies that we could work with, and one of them was significantly more expensive than the other. Now, I remember thinking so distinctively, why would I pay thousands of dollars more for something that is essentially the same service? I didn't even understand the question. And so, understandably, we went with the cheaper service. But what I didn't think about at that time was that there are necessary and obvious costs to finding, training, and transporting someone from Indonesia to Hong Kong. And if I wasn't paying those costs, someone else was. And that someone else was this worker. Now, after this woman lived in our home for a few weeks, we discovered that she had effectively been sold by her family when she was only 14 years old. At that time, she had to lie about her age, they gave her a fake passport, and they sent her to work in Singapore for several years. Now, after time there, she eventually made her way to Hong Kong, where families like mine unknowingly heaped debt and placement fees on her. And even though I considered myself a legal expert and a human rights advocate, after understanding her story and looking at the law, I came to the unsavory conclusion that I had unwittingly facilitated human trafficking. Now at this point, many of you are probably wondering like, what does hiring a foreign domestic worker have to do with modern slavery or human trafficking? I think when, when most people hear slavery, they immediately think about the transatlantic chattel slavery that's famous from US history. Or when they hear about human trafficking, they immediately think about uh, women and young women who are transported for sexual exploitation. Well, neither of those ideas are incorrect, but they are a bit out of date. You see, modern slavery is a microcosm of globalization. And so therefore, it has changed dramatically in the past 20 years. So as you can see from this chart, this blue line represents slave, or trafficking for sexual exploitation. 
So 20 years ago, as you can see, the vast majority of trafficking was indeed for sexual exploitation. But over the past 20 years, now over 80% of human trafficking is specifically related to forced labor. And similarly, as you can see from this chart, again, 20 years ago, it is true that the vast majority of victims of human trafficking were women and girls, but now it's pretty evenly split between males and females. So what qualifies then as human trafficking or modern slavery? The legal calculation of whether someone is a victim of these crimes is actually a lot more subjective and complicated than you might think. There are some characteristics that are consistent. For example, these, these six areas are generally considered legal characteristics uh, of, of trafficking and slavery. But since you can't just go check ownership anymore, officials have to do an analysis using these factors to make a subjective determination about whether someone is considered a victim. Now, these are the three most common forms of modern slavery and for, uh, sorry, the, the most common forms of modern slavery are forced labor, sexual exploitation, and debt bondage. And the first two are relatively straightforward. So forced labor, as you'd expect, is when someone is forced through violence or other means to work without pay. And sexual exploitation is when someone is forced to perform, perform sexual acts against their will. Now, for the most part, these, again, are what people think about when they think of slavery and trafficking. But that third one, debt bondage, it's by far the most prevalent form of modern slavery and by far the most common reason for human trafficking, but it's also the most difficult to understand. So what is debt bondage, or it's also known as bonded labor, what does it even mean? Well, let me give you a quick example. Two years ago, I was informed that a woman had been brought to Hong Kong by an employment agency from Kenya to be a domestic worker. Now, she was in a terrible working environment. She was being physically and verbally abused by a very mentally unstable employer. But the employment agency that brought her here, they had lied and deceived her about the conditions of stay, about the working environment, about the salary, and many other things. The agent took her passport from her and would not, allow her, uh, would not return it, requiring her to pay 80% of her salary for the first eight months that she was in Hong Kong, even threatening her family in Kenya if she didn't make those payments. Now, being completely cut off from everyone that she knew in a foreign country and desperately needing that job, she felt completely trapped. This is a situation that is shared by tens of millions of people around the world. Whether they're working in a Bangladeshi textile factory, or on a Thai fishing vessel, or even an entertainer on a cruise ship, this type of bonded labor is all around us. So debt bondage typically starts when someone is forced to pay a job for a job. Now you may not realize this, but international law states that no one should ever be required to pay for a job. And most countries have banned placement fees for employment. I would like to point out, Hong Kong has not done that, and we desperately need to. But there is a significant amount of information and power asymmetry in that process. So employment agents are able to deceive workers about employment conditions, their salary, and even their rights. So these job placement fees are obviously quite large. And these workers are generally poor and from developing countries. So obviously, most of them can't pay those fees. No big deal. The employment agency says, hey, don't worry. We will help to secure a loan for you to help pay for that placement fee and any other recruitment costs that you might have. But those loans are then collateralized using the worker's passport, which means that a moneylender or the agency itself holds the passport until that loan is paid in full. This is completely illegal in most countries, and yet it happens pretty much everywhere. Now let me give you a quick example. This is from one of our cases last year. The police in this instance, which by the way, is at a location like a 10 minute walk down the hill from here, the police seized 1,400 passports in a single location. Now they found 2,800, but they only seized 1,400. It was the largest police seizure of passports in history, in Hong Kong's history at least. 
and look at all those passports on the table and remember, every single one of those passports represents a worker who potentially or even probably is a victim of bonded labor. Now, the interest rates on these loans are killer. In Hong Kong, we routinely see rates over 200%, which again is completely illegal. That means thousands of migrant workers go months without ever seeing a paycheck. In fact, did you know that on any given day in Hong Kong, there are between 70 and 80,000 migrant workers who are not going to be paid for the labor they did that day. 70 to 80,000. Now remember, the primary reason why a migrant worker comes to a place like Hong Kong is to provide for their family. They can't go six to eight months without sending money home. So then what do they do? Of course, they take out more debt. And the cycle continues. Now you may be surprised to learn that the average migrant worker leaves Hong Kong with less money than when they came. And that's true for tens of millions of migrant workers around the year or around the world every single year. Now when you add all these factors together, that loan, it acts like a chain and it tethers the worker to the job, often in highly onerous and even abusive situations until the debt is completely paid off. Now there's obviously a big difference between, between being someone else's property versus being in debt. But the difference is one of degree, not necessarily one of effect. And while chattel slavery is clearly worse, this model, this modern model, is much more scalable and way more profitable. And it's way easier to hide in plain sight. Now, using this system, humans have effectively become commoditized. It used to be really expensive and slow to move people around, which is why ownership was such a key part of the slavery model. But as Professor Kevin Bales points out, that it's now so easy and so cheap to move people around that humans have essentially become fungible commodities, or as he describes them, quote, disposable people. Now, can you guess what that is? I know it's a little bit hard to see. That is data visualization that my team put together to show Hong Kong's largest black market. No, it's not related to drugs not related to triads, that represents Hong Kong's migrant worker employment agency and money lending industries. Every dot in that image represents either an employment agency or a money lender who are the two main players in the human trafficking and modern uh, slavery space. Now in Hong Kong alone, there are more than 1,500 domestic worker employment agencies. That's more than all the McDonald's, all the Starbucks, and all the 7-Elevens combined. Now, when I saw how many there were, I was shocked. My by my conservative calculations, that industry steals about 700 million Hong Kong dollars every single year from migrant workers. 700 million. And globally, it's billions of dollars. So after learning this, I wanted desperately to provide some transparency for the industry. So I did what seemed rational at the time, and I took a day trip up to Shenzhen, and I just started walking around like the Luowu market and started buying any hidden camera that I could find. Not creepy at all, I guess. <laughs> I bought fake glasses, I bought fake iPods, I bought like notebook cameras, I even bought a plastic water bottle that you could fill up and drink out of. And so then I came back and I, and of course, researched the law to make sure we didn't do anything illegal, but then my students and I started investigating employment agencies. So we trained dozens of foreign domestic workers to do this with us, and over a period of a few months, we had inspected more than 200 agencies here in Hong Kong. And as expected, although the Hong Kong government had consistently said that illegal placement fees were not charged here, our investigation showed that 70% of those agencies required a payment of an illegal fee in the very first conversation. They didn't even try to hide it. Like we were shocked at how open and unafraid they were about this practice. So actually here's a picture of the students that ran some of these initial investigations that was uh, in the, the front page of the SCMP. And from that moment on, HKU students have been key in all of our investigations. Now these cases, they're not sexy, they're not always, they don't always get a lot of attention, 
but experts believe that human trafficking is the fastest growing criminal industry in the world, and so it's critical that we all understand it. Now, let me give you another quick example, but for those who maybe watch this on video at some point and are not in Hong Kong, please understand that the situation I'm describing could occur anywhere because the, the situation is very similar regardless of, of where the migrant worker is in the world. So about three years ago, a young woman from the Philippines was, brought, was being brought by an employment agency that we'd been watching for quite some time. And this case was unique because we knew two months in advance that she was coming. So this gave us time to plan and we had this cross-border investigation all set up and the plan was that when she got to Hong Kong we were going to combine all the evidence and bring a case against the employment agency. But on her second day in Hong Kong we received a desperate message from her. She explained that the agency was forcing her to move to China and she was going to be one of the thousands of Filipina domestic workers who was illegally and unwantingly trafficked into China to work there. Now, she was desperate and she was begging for help. And you have to understand that if a migrant worker in most places reveals to the government any type of immigration infraction, they are the ones that will typically be arrested, even if they're being forced into that situation. So I reached out to my contacts at the Immigration Department in Labor, and I said, will you please grant her immunity so that she can testify without fear? But they wouldn't do it. And so there she was trafficked into China. To be honest, we felt completely helpless. Now, eventually our team was able to get her out of China. Working with law enforcement, we got the agency shut down and the owners of the agency were brought on criminal charges. But as I said, this was only one case out of thousands and to be honest, it never should have happened in the first place. But this happens every single day around the world, often with much worse outcomes. You may recall that last year, 39 Vietnamese people died crammed into a truck trying to get to the UK. So Vietnamese smugglers, they call this the CO2 route because it goes through a poorly ventilated um, trip across or under in the English Channel in a shipping container. 18,000 people are estimated to make that trip every single year. And even though this is human smuggling instead of human trafficking, they're still victims of bonded labor because they have to pay between 10,000 US dollars and $50,000 to make that trip. And for the skeptics who are out there and are thinking, well, these cases aren't so bad, please understand there are plenty of worse examples that I could give you here from Hong Kong. Like the time an Indonesian consular official told me about a young woman who'd been kept in a cage and raped every single day for months until she finally escaped. The consular official had to stand there while the police told the victim to not file charges and just go home. Because according to them, by reporting this case, it would only bring shame on her family. As a report, the case was never reported, her perpetrator was never prosecuted, and no one in the public ever heard about this case. Now you may be asking yourself, what can you do? To be honest, in a, in a time like in 2020, when it seems like there's so many things going on, and anxiety is an all-time high, I understand that big issues like this and climate change, which was discussed earlier, they seem unattainable. It seems like there's nothing you can do. Really all I'm asking you to do today, especially for those of you that live in an area like this, is to understand the issue so that you can see it on a daily basis. Be human, be empathetic, because the system of unequal uh, labor that exists currently will only create tension and problems in the future unless we address it now. Thank you.